Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Our talks in uh, this summer feature graduate students and postdocs who were nominated by, uh, to speak by their senior colleagues. Today, we have Dongguan Rio. Dongguan is currently working on his PhD under Alex Yosevich at the University of Rochester. We're happy to have him here today to tell us about near optimal restriction estimates for canter sets on the parabola. Take it away, Dongguan. Hey, yeah. First of all, thank you for giving me the uh, thank you or thank you for organizers for giving me the chance to speak, and thank you all for coming to my talk. I'm Dongun Ryu, and today I'm going to talk about near optimal restriction estimates for canter sets on the parabola. So let's just first talk about Bayesian notations. So we say a is smaller than with this scribble, and b means a is smaller than some constant times of b where this constant may depend on P and doesn't depend on any other parameters. And when we say A is approximate to B, it means A is smaller than some constant times of B and B is also smaller than some constant times of A. And if S is, F, if S is a set of integers, then S with bars and side means the number of elements of S, uh, the set S. And if S is a set in RD, then this S with vertical bars means the back measure of the set S. So let's start from Fourier transform. So Fourier transform is defined by integral of F times of e to the negative two pi i x x. And by potential, it is well known that L2 norm of F hat is same with L2 norm of F. So, we can, we can go one more step. So let M be a set in RD. So M is not just the whole space, but a subset of RD. And let's say measure mu be a corresponding measure supported on M. Then we want to find Q, which is between one and two, such that LQ norm of F hat respect to measure mu is smaller than some constant times of L2 norm of F. And by duality, this is equivalent to finding P greater than two or equal to two, such that F, uh, F d mu hat, LP norm of F d mu hat is smaller than L2 norm of F respect to the measure mu, where one, one over P plus one over Q is one. And F d mu hat is defined by integral of F in e, to the top, e to the power of negative two pi x c d mu x. So in this sense, this is called restriction estimate because in the first equation, first inequality, we're integrating over the set M instead of RD. But because of duality, we will mainly focus on the second inequality. So this is one typical example for measure mu. So it could be a measure supported on D minus one dimensional probability. So for example, this is also like useful in other fields. For example, a solution to Schrodinger equation is of this form. So Schrodinger equation is defined by one over i times of partial u over partial t equals to uh, Laplace of u and initial data is f of x. Then u of xt, its solution is defined by f hat times of e to the negative two pi x c plus four pi square i t c squared. So when you look at c variable, it's c and c squared. In that sense, it's only problem or probably. But it's not, this is not the main topic of this story. It's just to say that it has applications in other fields as well. So this is one of the most famous result in this area. In, in this restriction estimate. So this is called Stein-Thomas restriction estimate. So let's say mu be a surface carried measure on D minus one dimensional paraboloid, which is defined by as follows. So like F integral of F D mu is F X prime, X prime squared times of Psi X prime, where Psi is a compactly supported smooth function on R D minus one. So when we define the surface carried measure on the probability as follows, then 
for P greater than or equal to two D plus one over D minus one, LP norm of F D mu hat is smaller than L2 norm of F respect to the measure mu. And the range of P is sharp. So in the proof, uh, this observation played a key role. So Gaussian curvature of the probability is positive at any point, and that leads to the following Fourier decay. F d mu hat is smaller than c to the power of negative d minus one over two. And that was a very specific uh, model on the parabola, but if we assume that mu is supported on a lower dimension of probabilities, for example, like paraboloid or moment curve, then we can use its geometric properties like dimension, smoothness, and curvature. However, if you assume that mu is supported in a fractal set, for example, Cantor set, then this technique cannot be used anymore. For example, curvature is not defined on, so when you think of a defining function of a Cantor set, we cannot think of concept like curvature on Cantor set. However, this theorem can still be used on fractal measures. So this was proved by Machina and Mises, and the endpoint result was proved by Buck and Seeger. Let's say mu is a positive Borel measure in RD. Assume that there exists A and B such that measure of ball of radius R is smaller than R to the power of A, and uh, free transform of mu is smaller than C to the power of negative b over two. Then p greater than or equal to 4d minus 4a plus 2v over b following l2 lp estimate holds. So what I mean by L l2 lp estimate is the like equation inequality at the bottom. Like lp norm of f d mu hat is smaller than some constant times of l2 norm of f respect to the measured mu. So if mu is a surface carried measure on the paraboloid in stein thomas theorem, then A and B are both D minus one, and that recover the range in stein thomas theorem, which is P greater than two D plus one over D minus one. However, if we fix A and B, then there could, may, there could exist many measures which satisfies first two conditions. In that sense, we can ask to you can ask the following two questions. Yeah, so let's say uh, the first condition is ball condition, and the condition about F a mu hat is free decay, and the last one is L2 LP estimate. And the first question that we ask is, is there any measure whose range of P is sharp? And we want yes for the answer, which means we want to construct a measure which satisfies ball condition and free decay, but L2 LP estimate fails if P is smaller than 4D minus 4A plus 2B over B. And the second question is, for all measures, is the range of P sharp? And we want no for the answer, which means we want to construct a measure which satisfies ball condition, free decay, but L to LP estimate still holds even when P is smaller than the same number. So here's the answer to the first question so far. So Laba and Hambrook and Chen constructed such a measure when the dimension is one. And by the same method, Laba and Hambrook constructed such a measure when A and B are between D minus one and D. And all these examples come from probabilistic argument. So there is no explicit example known yet. And we can answer the second question now. So if mu is a measure supported on a set of Hausdorff dimension alpha, then Laba and, uh, Laba and Hambrook showed that if L2 LP estimate holds, then P has to be greater than or equal to 2D over alpha. And it is also well known in geometric measure theory that alpha is smaller than A, which comes from ball condition, and A is smaller than B, which comes from free decay. So when you put this together, we have the following diagram at the bottom. So if P is smaller than 
2D over alpha, then L2 LP estimate does not hold for any mu. And if P is greater than or equal to 4D minus 4A plus 2V over B, then L2 LP estimate holds for any mu. However, if alpha is smaller than D, there's a gap between these two numbers. So for that reason, we can restate the second question as follows. So we can ask if there's a measure mu supported on a Hausdorff measure alpha such that L2 LP estimate holds when P is D 2D over alpha. So Chen and Seeger constructed such a measure when alpha is D over K and K is an even integer. And Schumacher and Somala constructed such an example in one dimension and when alpha is between zero and half. And lastly, Laba and Wang constructed such a measure in nearly optimal sense. So they constructed a measure for all alpha and D, but their estimate holds when P is greater than or equal to 2D over alpha. So they are missing the endpoint. In that sense, their example is nearly optimal. And also, all these examples were come from probabilistic argument, different probabilistic argument, by the way. So there is no explicit, explicit example known yet. OK, so before we move on to next, do you have any question? OK, if you don't have, then let's move on to next. So this is the direction that we will focus today. So what will happen if we consider fractal sets on the parabola? So the parabola has positive curvature at any point, and that leads to the following L2 LP estimate on for P in stein thomas theorem. So that was the critical observation in stein thomas theorem. By the way, I, I skipped that equality on purpose because in order to obtain that in order, uh, equality, that requires another technique. So that is on purpose. Anyway, positive curvature played a key role in stein thomas theorem. So we can ask how this curvature will affect on fractal sets on the parabola. So if I make this question a little more specific, we can ask the second question with additional assumption that mu is supported on the parabola. So in other words, can we construct the measure mu supported on the set, uh, supported on the parabola such that L2 LP estimate holds even when P is smaller than 4D minus 4A plus 2B over B. And also, if that's possible, then we can ask how small can P be? So if mu is just an RD, then that was 2D over alpha. 2D over alpha was the smallest possible LP where which L2 LP estimate is possible. But with that additional assumption that mu is on parabola, we can ask the same question and see what happens to the lowest possible, the smallest possible. The natural uh, direction that we can think of is maybe we can try Lava and Wang's construction in our situation. However, it's not as easy as it sounds. So in Lava and Wang's argument, they consider the random Cantor set. So this is an example on how to construct the random Cantor set. First, we can divide this unit cube into nine pieces and randomly choose four out of nine. And for each chosen cube, we can divide this into nine pieces again, and then choose nine out of four independently in the sub cubes. And we can repeat on and on. So this is one example of how to construct random Cantor set. And yeah, I'll talk more about how to construct this random Cantor set later, but this is just rough sketch about how to construct this. And if we repeat this, then this random Cantor set can be covered by cubes of site one over R. And its free at transform is essentially supported by, so when you think of one over R cube, and when you take free at transform of it, then uh, its free at transform is essentially supported on the cube of site R centered at the origin. 
we can try the same thing on the cantor set on the problem. So first we can construct the cantor set on the unit interval. So this is at the bottom. And we can think of a, fract a subset of a parabola, which is above this random cantor set. So this will be our random cantor set on the problem. So then since this, uh, this parabola is curved, if since it has positive curvature, uh, if we say this interval as interval is of length one over R to the power of half, then subset above this problem, they are rectangles of size one over one over R to the power of half and one over R. So this, yeah, so this is not a this is not an interval anymore. This is a rectangles. These are rectangles of same like this and this size. So when you take one rectangle from that, and then when you take free transform of it, then so f sub i is supported on r to the power of negative half times r to the power of negative one rectangle. And its free transform is essentially supported on r to the power of half times of r rectangle. And the long side of this large rectangle is same with the, the direction of this long side of this rectangle is same with the short side of this small rectangle. And by the way, what I mean by essentially supported means its support could be, may not be this rectangle, but outside of this rectangle, if I had decays fast outside of this rectangle. In that sense, I'm saying that F sub i hat is essentially supported on this rectangle. So when you gather all of these large rectangles, then we have the following picture. So they all, they are all, so when you look at the subset of a parabola, the small rectangles, direction of the small, uh, uh, when you look at these rectangles, then direction of their short size are all different. It depends on where they are on the parabola. For that reason, for each large rectangles, direction of their long size are all different and they don't overlap. They overlap in a very small area at the center. So that is the main reason why we cannot directly use Lava and Wang's argument because each cube, one over R cube are all essentially supported in this R cube. However, on the on rectangles on the parabola, they are not, and they overlap in a very small area. So we should use these dual rectangles in a different way. So when you handle this problem, then we have the following theorem. So for alpha between zero and one, we can construct a measure mu on the parabola, which satisfies the following. So first, support of the measure nu has Hausdorff dimension alpha. And second, it has ball condition. So if, if we ignore epsilon on the exponent, then the measure of the ball of radius r is smaller than r to the power of alpha. And if you also ignore epsilon, then uh, free decay, which is nu hat, is smaller than one plus c to the power of negative alpha over two. And uh, lastly, which is the most important, for p greater than six over alpha, we have the estimate, we have L2 LP estimate for the measure nu. And p greater than six over alpha is sharp in the following sense. It's, yeah, it's near, near being sharp in the following sense, a little more precisely. So, if alpha is between zero and D minus one, and assume that measure nu is a Borel problem measure supported on the paraboloid, it's D minus one dimensional paraboloid, and the support has Hausdorff dimension alpha. And we also assume that measure of the ball of radius R is smaller than R to the power of alpha minus epsilon. Then if the, if the LQ, LP estimate holds, then P has to be greater than or equal to D plus one Q prime over alpha, where one over Q 
plus one over two prime is one. So in the previous slide, we considered when d is two and q is two. So when you're plugging that numbers, then p has to be greater than six over alpha. So p has to be greater than six over alpha. And we have an example where this L2 LP estimate holds when p is greater than six over alpha. In that sense, this example is nearly optimal. So this answers the question that we asked a few slides ago. So the question that we asked was, can we construct a measure supporting the parabola such that L2 LP estimate holds, even when p is smaller than the range from Markinov's theorem? The answer is possible. That is possible. And it can be as small as 6 over alpha. So when it comes to measures on R2, 4 over alpha was the smallest possible. But if you additionally assume that this measure is on the parabola, then 6 over alpha is the smallest possible instead of 4 over alpha. So in other words, it, like 4 over alpha uh, is raised to 6 over alpha because of the curvature. And also, we have an example where p equals to 6 over alpha is nearly, uh, we have an example for p equals to 6 over alpha exists in nearly optimal sense. Yeah. So these are main steps in the proof. And this is also almost same with Laban Wang's argument, but in detail, it's different because we use that dual rectangles in a different way. Okay, so it starts from lambda p set. And from lambda p set, we construct the Cantor set. And from this Cantor set, we find the coupling inequality. And then we construct local restriction estimate. And we have to prove free decay independently. And with free decay and combining free decay and local restriction estimate, we arrived at global restriction estimate, which is the goal about, which is the goal in the last, in this slide, which is L2 LP estimate. So let's start from lambda piece. So now this is about Fourier series. Let's say E of X is E to the power of two pi I X. Then for any subset in integers, uh, for any subset S instead of integers, Planchot's theorem implies that L2 norm of the Fourier series is same with small L2 norm of the sequence where the sequence is supported on the set S. So this is true for any subset S, uh, any, sub, any set S, which is a subset of integers. And also, for p greater than two, Holder's inequality imply that LP norm of the Fourier series is greater than or equal to L2 norm of the small L2 norm of the sequence. However, when you think of the opposite direction, it is not necessarily true. However, Rudin proved that if the opposite direction holds for any sequence, of, as any sequence C sub A, then size of set, size of the set S intersection negative n to n is smaller than n to the power of two over P. So we could say this is density of the set S because it holds for any n. So the next question is, does a set S with maximal density exist? In other words, it is asking if we can construct the set S such that S intersection negative n to n is approximately n to the power of two over p for all n, and also equation and equality 0.5 is satisfied. So this is called the lambda p set problem. And Rudin constructs an example when p is an even integer, but he didn't construct that when P is, P is a number which is other than even integer. And that was finally solved by Bruguet. And this was the 
critical step in his construction. So P is greater than two and we define, we already defined P of X. So for every N there exists a set S such that its size is N to the power of two over P and LP norm of the Fourier series is smaller than small L2 norm of the sequence when the sequence is supported on the set S. Such as Bruggen proved that such a set exists. And most importantly, the implicit constant that I didn't write here and like buried in this, buried in this squiggle, this implicit constant depends only on P but not on N. Because if we find an implicit constant depend on N, then that question becomes quite trivial. So this is non-trivial because this constant doesn't depend on N. And that was the critical step in his construction. So let's say the set as satisfies above is a lambda P set. And we can move on to constructing the Cantor set from lambda P set. So n sub j is a sequence such that n sub naught is one and n sub j is approximately j. And let large n sub j is a product from n sub j, n sub naught to n sub j. So at each, and this is the first step. So we can choose a lambda p set a sub one in, in the interval from zero to n sub one to the power of half intersection, the set of integers. And we can scale it into a unit interval, and that'll be a sub one. And after j step, this is how to construct j plus one's the Cantor set in Jane's j plus one step. So for each chosen a sub j, a sub j, a sub j is a set of integers, a subset of a set of integers. So for each a in a sub j, we choose lambda p set, which is in the interval from zero to n sub j plus one to the power of half intersection set of integers. And that'll be s sub j plus one comma a. And we shift it by n sub j to the power of half times of a. And that'll be a sub j plus a. And we gather all these a sub j plus a, then that'll be a sub j plus one. And we can scale it down to the unit interval, and that'll be j plus one step. So here's the like simple picture on how to construct that. So in this case, we divide unit info interval into three pieces and choose two, which corresponds to the lambda p set. And for each chosen interval, we divide the first interval into four pieces. So there are we're considering in set of integers, we're considering from zero to three and then choose lambda p set. And then scale it down to this chosen interval. And independently in the second interval, we also choose lambda p set and scale it into this unit, uh, this sub interval. In the next step, we can uh, choose another lambda p set in each sub intervals and on and on. So this is how Lavang Lang constructed the Cantor set on the unit interval by choosing lambda p set. So yeah, now we can consider measures from this uh, this e sub j. So e sub j is a measure which is defined as follows: so intersection of an uh, inter integral of f d mu j is integral of f one over time, uh, one over Lebesgue measure of e sub j times of characteristic function on e sub j. So this is a measure on the Cantor set or j Cantor set e sub j. And with this mu sub j, we can construct nu sub j. So function f is on R2 and we will integrate f of x x squared d mu j. So support of the measure nu sub j is a subset of a parabola, which is above e sub j. So in this sense, the measure nu sub j is supported on the subset of parabola. 
Okay, so by letting j to infinity, nu sub j and mu sub j converges weakly to measure mu, mu and nu respectively. And if you let p be two over alpha, then Hausdorff dimension of their supports are both alpha. So we construct a measure supported on the set of Hausdorff dimension alpha. And mu is on the unit, mu, mu is on the unit interval and nu is on the parabola. And now we need to connect lambda p set and restriction estimate. The well, lambda p set is about Fourier series and restriction estimate is about Fourier transform on RD. In this case, R2. So there we need something that we can connect this. And that is decoupling inequality. So let's first see how Labine argument, Labine Wang's argument goes. So they considered P sub J of E sub J. So this is a partition of E sub J into intervals of lengths N sub J to the power of negative half. So for I, so this is the picture. So when you have E sub J, this is consists of intervals of lengths N sub J to the power of half. So I, this is part this partition is a set of those intervals. And if I is in this partition, then F sub I hat is a restriction of F restrict over if, if this is a restriction of F on this interval I. And D sub P of E sub J is called small L to large G large LP decoupling constant of EJ or, or simply just decoupling constant of E sub J, which is defined by the following. So LP norm of summation of F sub I is smaller than D sub P of E sub J times of small L2 norm of large LP norm of F sub I. And D sub P of E sub J is the smallest constant such that this inequality holds. And what Labine Wang showed was, since this E sub G was constructed from lambda P set, D sub two over alpha of E sub J is smaller than N sub J to the power of epsilon. And that lead to the local following local restriction estimate. So if F is a sub F is a F hat is supported on E sub J, then L two over alpha norm of F on the ball of radius and sub J to the power of half is smaller than the coupling constant of the coupling constant D sub two over alpha of E sub J times of L two norm of F respect to the measure mu sub J. And that lead to the following restriction estimate or measure mu. So this is called the restrict local restriction estimate because we're integrating over the ball of radius R, not the whole space R2. And also the constant in front of this L2 norm depends on this radius of this bar. So if we extend R to infinity, then R to the power of epsilon will diverge to infinity. So when you integrate over the ball, when you integrate over the whole R2, then this will not be bounded. But at least we integrate over the ball, then we have the following estimate. In that sense, it's called local. So let's go back to our situation. Similarly, we can also define corresponding decoupling constant as well. So now we, now we define omega sub i. So omega sub i is a rectangle of size n sub j to the power of negative half and n sub j to the power of negative one, which is a subset of a parabola and above i. And we also say f sub omega sub f sub omega sub i hat is a restriction of f, like it's just f hat times of characteristic function on omega sub i. And we can also define the coupling constant as follows. This is the same way the coupling constant on for the Cantor set, but it just we're considering the different region. 
So let's say this decoupling constant is d sub p of p sub j, which is the smallest constant such that LP norm of summation of f sub omega sub i is smaller than d sub p of p sub j times of small L2 norm of large LP norm of f sub omega sub i. Yeah, so there is a result. We can, there is a result as follows. So it was proved by Chang, Dios Pont, Greenfield, Jamnation, Lee, and Madrid. And they proved that if we have a decoupling constant for a certain Cantor set, then we can update it to a decoupling set of a fractal set on the parabola. So when you have this of P of E of J, then this exponent is increased from P to 3P, and we can obtain a decoupling constant, decoupling constant of a fractal set on the problem, which corresponds to E sub J. And Blab and Wang already proved that D sub 2 over alpha of E sub J is smaller than N sub J to the power of epsilon. So when you combine these two, then we obtain that six, uh, D sub 6 over alpha of P sub J is smaller than N sub J to the power of 2 epsilon. So now we obtain the coupling constant for the fractal set on the parabola. Now we had to local restriction estimate. So this is a lemma that we need to go to the local restriction estimate. So for L greater than 2J, assume that F hat is supported on the subset of the parabola above E sub L. Then L6 over alpha norm of F over the ball of radius N sub J is smaller than N sub 2J to the power of epsilon times of D sub 6 over alpha of P of 2J times of L2 norm of F with respect to the measure nu sub L. So it uses mixed norm interpolation and modification of lava and Wang's argument. We can also, so from this lambda, we can also obtain the following local restriction estimate for the measure nu. The ball of L6 over alpha norm of F d mu hat over the ball of radius R is smaller than R to the power of epsilon times of L2 norm of the measure, and L2 norm of the function F respect to measure nu. So we can compare what happened in Laban Wang, Laban Wang's version of restriction estimate and this version of restriction estimate. So first we may see the L2, like first equation, which is about like nu sub j and uh, mu sub j and mu sub L. Then in the first equation, in Laban and Wang's version, they integrate over the ball of radius n sub j to the power of half. And they consider L2 over alpha norm. However, in our situation, we considered L6 over alpha norm over the ball of radius n sub j instead of n sub j to the power of half. Also, we consider L, which is greater than 2j. So this is like on top we have mu sub j, but in this case we have nu sub l where n l is greater than or equal to 2j. So this is had this is happening because because of these dual rectangles. Since these dual rectangles doesn't overlap, they overlap at a very small area and they over doesn't overlap in these very large areas. So this for this reason we are considering. This is why these differences are happening. Yeah. However, you're right that the same local restriction estimate. Okay, so we talked about lambda p set, decoupling, and local restriction estimate. So yeah, before we talk about before we talk about free decay, let's first talk about how free decay will derive global restriction estimate. 
So when we have the following local restriction estimate that we just proved before, and if there's a free decay that uh, new hat is smaller than one plus c to the power of negative b over two for some b rather than for some positive b, then we can use tau's epsilon removal argument with this local restriction estimate. Then we have global restriction estimate, which is LP norm of F d mu hat is smaller than L2 norm of F respect to the measure nu for P greater than six over alpha. So this is why it is called global restriction estimate. A local restriction estimate, we integrate over the ball where our radius R. However, now we can integrate the whole region R2. And that's why we're missing the endpoint. If we send, so it uses local restriction estimate. So it cannot be better than local restriction estimate when P is exactly six over alpha. So when, when you're considering L six over alpha norm and send R to infinity, then R to the power of epsilon converges, diverges to infinity. So we don't have L2 LP estimate when P is six over alpha. So we are losing six over alpha, but for P greater than six over alpha, we can still establish global restriction estimate. Okay, so now let's talk about free ADK. So when you're constructing the random, uh, when, you're, when you're constructing a Cantor set from lambda P set, there's, there was no random construction. There was no random structure. However, this is where this random structure comes into play. So we consider random translation. So the first sentence is similar to what happened in when you're constructing the Cantor set. So this is happening at J step after J step. So for each A in A sub J, we choose lambda two over alpha set in in the interval from zero to n sub j plus one to the power of half intersection of set of integers. So this is same with what happened in constructing Cantor set. But after that, we consider a random variable, random variable v of j a. So probably that v of j a will be v is n sub j plus one to the power of half, which means that so V is a certain number from zero to n sub j to the power of half. And for all V, for all V in this, for all numbers in this interval, they have fair chance of being chosen. All numbers have same chance of being chosen. And we'll just randomly choose, pick a number in this interval, and that'll be V of J A. After we choose a number, we shift it, we shift n sub s of j plus one comma a by v of j a, and then take mod, modular of n sub j plus one to the power of half. So that means if we choose this black intervals, yeah, if we choose these intervals as our a sub j plus a, and then if we shift it by v j a, then some part will, yeah, some part will go above n sub j to the power of half. Then we put this part on the left of, yeah, on the left of this interval. And then that'll be, that'll be set after taking modular on n sub j to the power of half. So this much, yeah, so after we putting the intervals on the right to the left, that'll be our S of J plus one comma A comma V, which is the one after taking module. Then the rest step and, and the rest step is almost same. We shift this S of J plus one comma A comma V by N sub J to the power of A, N sub J to the power of half times of A, and then gather all these a sub j plus one a v, then that will be a sub j plus one. 
and we scale it down to unit interval, and that'll be E sub J. And the, the way we consider measure is also the same. And since now we will consider free transform of each measures, free transform of each measures are defined as follows. So free transform of mu sub J is integral of E to the power of negative two pi X, two pi I X C, uh, d mu x, d mu i, a uh, d mu j, and uh, free transform of nu sub j is an integral of e to the power of two pi i, negative two pi i, x c1 plus c2, c, uh, sorry, integral of e to the power of negative two pi i, x c1 plus x squared c2, d mu j. So Schmirk and Sumala, they prove that almost surely the following holds for the limit measure mu. So the Fourier decay of measure mu hat is smaller than c to the power of negative alpha over two. And as an analog of that, almost surely the following holds for the limit measure nu. So uh, free transform of nu is smaller than C, 1 plus c to the power of negative alpha over 2. So when I when you say when you say that this estimate holds almost surely, that means the implicit constant may depend on mu epsilon and the measure mu and nu. Almost surely means that probability that the implicit constant exists is one. It could be large or it could be small, but probably that such a constant exists, that is one. And also note that measure nu, a measure mu, measure mu is supported on the Cantor set and measure nu is supported on the subset of a parabola, which is above a Cantor set. In that sense, they are different. Another thing that I want to stress out is there is no relation between implicit constants between them. In other words, if this, this two theorem doesn't imply the following. So if mu is smaller than some constant time, some constant c sub e times of c to the power, c to the power of negative alpha over two, then above theorems doesn't imply that nu hat is also smaller than the same constant times of c to the power of negative alpha over two. There is no relation between these two measures yet. Yeah, it could be, but this theorem doesn't imply that. And here's another thing that I want to say about the theorem that I talked in the previous slide. So there's a concept called slam set. If there's a measure mu supported on the sub, supported on the set S such that uh, we can define B naught. So B naught is the supremum of beta such that free transform of mu is smaller than c to the power of negative beta over two for some measure mu. So if such a measure mu such exists on the set S and if beta naught is supremum of such betas, then we say S has free dimension beta naught. And it is also known that free dimension of a set is cannot be bigger than house Stewart dimension. So if free dimension and house Stewart dimension are same, then we say the set S is a slam set. For example, the paraboloid is a slam set because house Stewart dimension of the paraboloid is, is quite trivial, D minus one. And if mu is a, is a surface carried measure on the parabola that we talked in, the, in this talk earlier, then mu hat is smaller than c to the power of negative beta or beta uh, neg a negative d minus one over two. So that means beta naught is d minus one. So they have, it has the same free dimension with house dimension. So this is a very typical example of a slab set. So when you consider nu again, Nu is supported on the set of house root dimension alpha. And we also proved that uh, nu hat is 
smaller than C to the power of negative alpha over two. So that means support of the measure nu is a slam set. And also it is supported on the subset of, it, it is supported on the parabola. And parabola is also slam set. In that sense, this is interesting because uh, the support of measure nu is a slam set in another slam set. And also in order to prove the global estimate, we just need a free decay whose exponent is just positive. However, it turned out that new head has best decay, free, uh, best possible free decay. Yeah, so the key idea is similar to Kaufman's result. So he used Hofting's inequality and Van der Kolb lemma, but he proved only the existence in a different setting. So this is a very yeah, rough sketch of the proof. So we can divide the size of C into three cases. When C is small than n sub j to the power of half, that's when it is inside of this red rectangle. And when C is large, larger than small n sub j to the power of half times of n sub j, that's when it is outside of this black rectangle. And C is in between. When C is small, which is inside of this small red rectangle, then we use probabilistic argument, which is Hofting's inequality, and the same with Schmerkin and Sumala's method. And C is large, we use Van der Kolb lemma. And intuitively speaking, when C is outside of this large rectangle, then it is outside of any large rectangles. And we already said that, like, F sub omega sub i head decays fast outside of these rectangles. And when C is outside of this large rectangle, a large square, then it is outside of any of these large rectangles. In that sense, it decays fast from any rectangles. That is the like core idea in Van der Kolb lemma. And when C is between this red rectangle and black rectangle, uh, red square and black square, then we use both of this method carefully. That's how we can obtain the free decay. So this is a summary of the result. We construct a measure which satisfies, measure nu, which satisfies the following. And the support of the measure nu has house strict dimension alpha and measure of the ball of radius r is small than alpha to the power of alpha, r to the power of alpha because it was constructed from lambda p set. And it has free decay, which is new head is smaller than c to the power of alpha over two. And it came from a random translation. And also with decoupling and lambda p set, the measure new satisfy the following L2 LPL estimate for p greater than six over alpha. Okay, so I'll stop here and thank you for listening. Okay, let's thank our speaker by clicking buttons. I also thank you by saying words. Thanks. Um, and we'll stop the recording.